Hi, everyone. Um, if you are joining for the PPMD webinar on the recent Elevadis approval, you're in the right spot. We're just going to give it um, another couple of seconds to let people um, filter in. We had a, a lot of people register for this uh, webinar, so we want to make sure everyone has a chance to get on. All right, uh, looks like we have a good number of people and it's starting to slow down a bit. So um, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for uh, this PPMD uh, webinar on the Elevitus approval, uh, what this means for you and your family. Um, I think at the start of this, we want to acknowledge, of course, that this is a really exciting time for Duchenne. We're you know, um, very thrilled to have our, our first approval of a gene therapy. Um, and while that's exciting and we're hopeful that kind of continues to spur on development, we also know this is a really complicated time and we're talking about a really kind of complex topic here. And we've had a lot of questions from the community since uh, the approval on the 22nd about access, about restrictions, what the label means. Um, and so we wanted to take some time and make sure we could start to talk through um, some of these questions that we've seen come through the community. And I think this is going to be an ongoing discussion um, as we continue to learn more. Uh, but the, the goal of Today's webinar is to talk through some of the things around gene therapy, um, the label, some of the benefit and risks, and some of the logistics around access. Um, gene therapy is a it's it's a much more um, complex uh, therapy than some of the other ones that, that we've seen approved for DMD, um, and so there's you know always new learnings uh, for for the community. So Amer Camino, PPMD is vice president of research. At um, I'm joined today by Pat Furlong, our president and CEO, and then our presenters today, Dr. Russ Butterfield from the University of Utah and Dr. Sue Apcon from Colorado Children's, who are going to take, take us through some of this uh, material. Um, we are going to have an open Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if you have questions, you can just submit them to the chat function at the bottom of your screen. We did get a lot of questions submitted ahead of time, so we will also try to tackle as many of those um, as we can. And we are recording this webinar. So um, if you have a, a friend or a family member who, you know, this would be a value to that missed it, please let them know. Um, we hope to have this back up on the website in, in about a week's time. Um, but with that, I think we are going to jump in and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Butterfield to get us started. All right. Thanks, Eric. Um, let me just get my screen up here. I think that gets the right screen shared. Um, and Eric, I think you went through the, the objectives pretty well, but we'll just start talking some gene therapy basics, a little bit of more specific information about Elevidus and the FDA approval, and then talk really in practical terms, risks, benefits, and logistics, and, and then have some discussion and questions at the end. Um, so I, I really wanted to start this conversation talking about genetic therapies in general, just to have a framework for where this new gene therapy fits in the, in the overall um, idea of therapies for these disorders. And, and to do that, uh, the, I like this idea of the central dogma, which is information and flow in biologic systems that really flows from DNA to RNA to protein. And we have the ability to intervene at any of those stages, right? So um, if we think of FDA approved therapies that are already there, we're intervening at a stage that's, um, transcribing the DNA into RNA, and we're interrupting the splicing with the FDA-approved exon skippers that are there. Um, there's FDA-approved uh, splicing modulators for spinal muscular atrophy that are in common use in many of our clinics. Um, and, the, and you can intervene at the next level, that translational level that goes from RNA to protein. And, and Adelorin, this is probably the best known example of that, that's approved in Europe for DMD, but not here in the United States. And those, any of those therapies may work more or less well. But when most of us think about genetic therapy, genetic medicine, we think about gene replacement, right? That's where we're working right on the DNA itself. So that's where we're going to really spend the time. And to do gene replacement, we really need a couple of things. Um, but viruses 
are really well suited to do all of those things. And that's really, we need to deliver DNA into the nucleus of a cell and not just any cell, but the cell we want. And we wanna be able to turn that gene on in that cell. And the, the virus that is most commonly used that we'll talk about today is called the new associated virus or AAV. It's a pretty small virus, but it does what viruses do very well. They attach themselves to a cell, they get inside and they just deposit the genetic material inside. Only in this case, the genetic material inside is not a virus gene, it's a gene that we care about. Um, and, and ultimately that viral gene ends up as a small circular piece of DNA in the nucleus of the cell, where it transcribes, it makes an RNA copy of itself that's translated into a, a construct of the dystrophin protein. And that, that delivery mechanism using a virus comes at a cost and that cost is a generation of an immune response. And that immune response can be both to the virus itself uh, which is sort of a normal way of thinking about how we respond to viruses, but also can be to the gene when it gets turned on. So we'll, we'll talk about a couple different ways that that's important. Um, and, and as you think about these gene therapy constructs, I really think of them in three parts. So there's a transgene, so the gene we care about, and, that, and people kind of know about that. A couple of things about that. It's not like a normal gene, and we do these manipulations in the structure of that gene to optimize its chance to be made in the cell that we want. Um, every transgene has a promoter, and that promoter tells it which cell to turn this gene on and that, and when to turn on. And, and for a muscle, we want it to turn on in muscle, but not in the liver, for example. So, the, so the, we have the transgene, the promoter, and then we have the vector. That's this virus AAV. There's lots of different other vectors that are out there in the gene therapy world that people are using, but AAVs are the ones that are really by far the most developed. Um, and they're, they're they're very good at delivering DNA. There's different serotypes that deliver uh, more or less specifically to different tissues, but their major flaw in a sense is that they're small and you can only fit a small gene inside this very small virus. Um, and, and just to give you a sense of, of that, the magnitude of that, AAVs hold about 4.7 kilobases of genetic material. That's 4,700 letters long of sequence. And uh, the DMD gene, if you take the full length DMD gene in the, in the genome, uh, it's 2 million letters long. That's, that's, and, and as you process that gene and get it down to its RNA, it's 14,000 uh, letters long. So in any case, no matter how you dice it up, the DMD gene is, is way too big to fit inside one of these AAVs. And so the, the solution to that is something called microdystrophin or mini dystrophin. And, and these are constructs of the DMD gene. And, and what you see here, and you, you'll see different variations of, of diagrams like this, I think, as you think about gene therapy. But, but you have this very long protein with some repetitive elements to it in DMD. And not all of those repetitive elements are absolutely necessary for the function of the DMD protein. And um, we know this based on patients with Becker muscular dystrophy. In fact, patients sometimes with very mild versions of Becker muscular dystrophy, but can have very large deletions of a large part of the gene. And so over time, just based on those observations, people have developed these microdystrophin constructs. Um, and, and these can fit inside an AAV, right? We can get them small enough. So here's just another representation of that full length dystrophin with some of these repetitive elements and the clinical and some of the the available microdystrophins are being used in clinical trial. And this one, SRP9001, is the one that's included in Elevidus. Um, and and uh, as you think about that construct, it's using an AAV called RH74 serotype. Um, it's, and it's just approved a few weeks ago, as you know. And then there's not just that FDA approved, but there's ongoing clinical trials. But it's not the only microdystrophin under study. Um, Pfizer has a fairly well-developed program for microdystrophin uh, using an AV9 vector. It's now in a phase three clinical trial that's ongoing. Um, Solid is another company uh, working on AV gene therapy, and they had a study using an AV vector called Ignite. Uh, that product is called SGT001, but now have a newer product they're working on that will use a novel capsid, so a different viral vector that hopefully will have less, more tropism to muscle, less, less potential side effects. Regenix, Bio, and Genathon also have different constructs. And I, I sort of 
think of these as ice cream. One of them is strawberry, one's vanilla, one's chocolate, but they're all ice cream. They're just different flavors of the same idea. We're going to package inside a virus a gene that's going to function in this uh, as a functional disjoint. So that, that's sort of the background. And this is really the more specific construct for Olevitis. Um, and maybe I'll just say one thing about the names of these gene therapies, because they're difficult and you have to practice before the talk, Dell and Distrogene Moxiparlobec. And you have to say it 10 times, else you just mess it up. When it comes down to Olevitis, it's a lot easier to say. Um, these names, every one of these gene therapies that's approved has a two-part name like this. The first part reflects the gene or the transgene, that's why it ends in gene. And the last part of, reflects the vector, and that's why the VEC, or the, you know, the last part of the word. In this case, it's parvovec, and that reflects that the adeno-associated virus is a parvovirus, and that's the vector. So that's, you can hopefully start to make sense of some of these as they come out with very unusual names. Uh, um, in, in the case of Levitis, it has an MHCK7 promoter. That means it's going to turn on in muscle, in skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle. We build this intron into that structure, which helps it become expressed more fully in this thing called the poly A tail, these little ends that, are, that bind on each other. And then we package that all up in this AAV or 74 vector. So that's the actual thing that's being infused when we deliver this drug. Um, so, so with that background, I wanted to just cover um, the basics of the label. So, and I just paste, I just took a screenshot here of the label to do that. And, and so we'll kind of walk through it step by step. So Elevitus is an AV based gene therapy. It's indicated for patients age four and five with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. You have to have a demonstrated genetic mutation. And, and the important part, he, the next important part here is this approved under an accelerated approval process. And it's not based on clinical benefit. It's based on the surrogate marker of microdystrophin expression. I wanna just spend a minute kind of walking through what that, what that accelerated approval process means and kind of how it started. And, and to do that, you kind of have to understand the not accelerated approval process. This traditional approval requires two independent phase three trials. That means a randomized blinded trial, often a very large trial that show efficacy of a drug in a clinical endpoint. So for something like Duchenne, we would show in a randomized clinical trial that we make a boy's muscles stronger or give them some a specific clinical benefit. Um, but the accelerated approval process is really there to grant early approval if you can meet a certain level of evidence based on surrogate endpoints. And the goal there is that you can treat a serious life-threatening condition to fill an unmet medical need, often in areas of rare disease where there might not be a lot of incentive to develop drugs for companies. Um, and, and in this case, the, the important part of that is you can base the approval on a surrogate endpoint. And that could be anything. It could be a, some sort of imaging endpoint. It could be a blood test that you measure. In this case, it's the measurement of that microdystrophin protein production in a muscle. And, and another important part of the accelerated approval is that that still requires studies to confirm the clinical benefit. So even if we get that first approval, um, we have to to go on and do those bigger studies. And that's indicated right here in the label that continued approval is, con is contingent on verification of the clinical benefit. That study is already ongoing. And that's the Embark study. It's a phase three randomized trial. So um, it's including boys age four to eight, 10 to seven years old, 126 participants, they're randomized. So you know half the patients get placebo, half the patients get drug and they're followed for a year. And in this case, instead of an endpoint based on expression of dystrophin protein, the endpoint is, do we make them better? And the measurement tool we're using for that is called NSA score. Uh, so it's, it's a very different structure study. And we have secondary endpoints about dystrophin expression, safety, and other motor functions. So this study, it's already ongoing. It's fully enrolled as of last September. And so the last patient uh, that you know, what's enrolled last September will finish that first year coming up this September. We should have a readout on it, hopefully early uh, in 2024, or late 2023. So that's a really important part of this conditional approval. A um, couple other things that I want to just just cover with a, 
a little bit of detail, and it's this approval based on the microdystrophin expression. I want to just show you the data that underlies that approval. So this is a figure from the FDA's uh, briefing document that was presented a few weeks ago at, at the advisory committee meeting. And what this is showing is the dystrophin, the microdystrophin expression. So every dot is an individual patient. Um, and in orange is sort of those early studies that had a process of manufacturing under one scenario. And in green, it's a process manufacturing in another scenario, but they're, they're similar. And, and what you're seeing is a measurement of, of the dystrophin expression. What you see is it's pretty variable, but can be quite high in some patients and quite low in other patients. Uh, the two different manufacturing processes are probably probably roughly equivalent that way. And, and we're seeing something a little less than 50% here and a little more than 50% here of dystrophin expression. So this is the data that actually meets the criteria for the accelerated approval. Um, if you look at a patient with muscular dystrophy with Duchenne, you would just see 0%, right? It would just, they would all be down here on that zero line, basically. So, so this really, I think, meets that criteria pretty well. There was some discussion in the advisory committee about whether it meets the other half of that criteria, which is, does that dystrophin, microdystrophin expression predict a clinical benefit? Um, and, and we think that's a pretty reasonable assertion, right? That, that, that just stands to reason. These are the the motor function data that went into that approval. And again, I just pasted these figures from the FDA briefing document. And what you're seeing is the data from patients on the placebo controlled trial. So the treated patients in red and the placebo patients in blue. And you're looking at this motor function assessment called NSAA. And, and, and what we're looking at is a change from baseline. So everyone starts at zero and the placebo kids improve here in the younger cohort, age four and five, and the placebo shows some improvement, not as vigorous improvement as we saw in the treated kids. And then in the six and seven year olds, we see it's really hard to differentiate those two curves. And this is what I think led the FDA to make that approval to just age four and five years old. And you can have some conversations, and I think you saw this if you watched any of the advisory committee meeting about why we might not have seen as a robust of a change in these older children. Uh, we're hopeful that the, the, the phase three trial that's ongoing will really help to separate these out and show benefit in older children as well. But this is really, I think, the data that was leading the FDA to make that decision for, for that narrow approval to six, four to five year olds. So, so what about the administration? So, so this is the next part of the, the label there. Um, you can't have antibodies to the vector, right? If you have antibodies to the vector, you'll just inactivate the therapy and it won't do anything. So we will test for the vector. Uh, the dose is here is described 1.33 times 10 to the 14. I just wanted to give a sense for what that number means. That is a really high number. It's 133 trillion vector genomes per kilogram. And what that means is we've measured the trans gene 133 million times. Um, per kilogram, right? So times that by your weight in kilograms. Um, there can be other things in that drug. So there can be empty capsids and that manufacturing process is really important to be able to know that and that helps drive some of the uh, adverse events that we've seen. So knowing that's important. If I put it in, I draw it all out. So it's like 133 with 12 zeros. It's a really high number. Uh, I just looked up the highest number I could think of, which the US national debt is 32 trillion. So, it, but this is 10 times that. Um, a lot of the rest of the things I think that we think about with gene therapy are driven by that really, really high number. And that drives an immune response to the virus. And it's not like any natural infection that you ever might face. And, and so it can drive some unusual immune responses. But you get to the end of that and it's an IV infusion. It lasts one to two hours. And it's really, of all of this process, the least interesting. Uh, the IV infusion takes an hour. It's just a clear liquid, it goes in there. And then everybody shouts, right, but balloons don't come down or the, you know, there's no lightning bolts, it's just kind of anticlimactic. Um, and it's probably the safest part of everything we do. There is a specific contraindication mentioned in the label, and this excludes patients with a deletion that involves exon 8 
and or exon 9 in the DMD gene. And this is a, a really complicated thing to explain like in the time frame that we have. But the reason for that exclusion is a risk for a myositis. And this is an immune response to that transgene. If that transgene gets turned on, you can have an immune response to it and actually cause a lot of problems in the muscle. This is just a screenshot I took from a, a webinar that PPMD describing some of the reason that these type of responses can happen and why they're localized to those two exons. This is a link to it at the bottom. So you can go back and find the, the details of that on, on the PPMD website, but it's a really important exclusion. And, and it's actually quite a narrow exclusion based on the data. So hopefully we're not excluding too many patients based on that risk. Other genotypes are available to be treated with this um, gene therapy, just, just if the mutation includes exon 8 or exon 9. So duplications, deletions, um, nonsense or stop mutations, any of those would be amenable to treatment. Um, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of these uh, potential serious adverse events, and then Dr. Apcon will cover them in a little more detail, but they're, they're around the label and they're described in some detail as you go through the label, but there's risk for serious liver injury for the immune-mediated myositis, which I already mentioned, which is an inflammation of the muscle itself based on a response to that gene. Um, and then the myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart muscle. And one thing we know about these AAV viruses, they're actually a little more tropic to the heart muscle than to the skeletal muscle. And there's, there's some risks there that relate to the heart that we need to be careful about. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Apcon, and we'll kind of go through some of the details of the logistics and, and the safety things. Thank you, Dr. Butterfield. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I zoomed in. Can someone let me know if you're seeing the full screen? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, thanks um, uh, for covering um, the really important part, uh, rest of, um, of this approval, um, including sort of who might be eligible, um, and, and more importantly, sort of the background of, of, of what gene therapy or gene transfer is. Um, because I think from a, a family and patient perspective, it's super important to know um, kind of the mechanism of action, how this works, uh, why we um, I think it will lead to improvement um, before you even make a decision about wanting to move forward with this treatment. I'm going to jump in and talk about the risks um, associated with this type of uh, therapy. And um, I, before I actually talk about some of the individual risks, I just want to talk in general why um, there are some of these safety related issues. So you've heard Dr. Butterfield talk about the the liver injury uh, as an example of myocarditis. Um, and the risk is really related to an immune response. Um, when we get colds, um, a typical viral illness, our body mounts an immune response. Um, and there's several different ways that our body can mount a, an immune response. Some of it is innate, meaning it is just um, at a basic level, we have the ability um, to uh, mount a response uh, to all um, infections, and then we adapt to particular types of uh, infections. And so you'll hear people talk about this innate and then adaptive. And that um, th that um, response predicts a little bit about sort of the timeline in which we see different side effects. So the response or the immune response we're talking about uh, is generally to the viral vector, so the AAV, RH in this case, vector. Uh, and it also can be to the transgene um, uh, as well. Fortunately, we're able to mitigate um, many of those responses through the use of high-dose steroids. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the steroid protocol in a minute, but knowing uh, that we have the ability to mitigate um, some of these risks with uh, additional steroids um, is, is quite helpful. In the future, currently and in the future, there may be other medications that work on the immune system in different ways than steroids that might help mitigate uh, any of these serious adverse events. As I mentioned, there's a pretty predictable timeline for the events. You'll hear us talk about you know, week one and then weeks four to six or eight. Um, and what you'll see um, is that the initial um, uh, days following the um, infusion 
you'll have the risk of things like nausea and vomiting, um, a flu-like uh, illness, and then myocarditis, again, the inflammation of the heart, and then I'll talk a little bit about something called thrombotic microangiopathy, and then it's week four to six where we see the other. So I saw in the chat, someone asked a little bit about kind of the percent, like what is the risk of having some of these side effects? And you can see here by the numbers, they're common. Usually in the package insert, we see anything that's over 5%. And in this case, we're seeing more than half of the kids who were treated in the clinical trial had vomiting uh, as part of their post-infusion side effect. Nausea in a large percent. In over a third of the patients, we are seeing an increase in liver function tests. Um, that doesn't describe necessarily a third have the most severe, um, but there is an increase uh, in about a third. About a quarter will have a fever. And again, that's uh, generally within the first few days. Uh, and then a decrease in platelet count also is again above that greater than 5% threshold. You saw the, the box on, uh, I have on the right of my slide. You already saw it uh, from Dr. Butterfield's slide. And we decided that we would include it in both presentations because we wanted people to understand um, the potential um, severe, serious um, risk associated with gene transfer therapy. Um, the AAV vectors sort of um, hide out in the liver, which uh, causes this immune response. And so again, uh, we worry about uh, the serious liver injury. We talked about the immune-mediated myositis, and at least in the uh, in the clinical trials, what was found was just those with the deletions um, within the exons eight or nine, um, the deletions within those uh, eight or nine uh, were at risk, uh, which is again why uh, the FDA label um, uh, uh, alerts to the fact that these kids would not be amenable to this treatment. And then myocarditis. And as, as we think about um, those, those risks, um, we, we can learn from our experience with other gene therapy. So Dr. Butterfield mentioned uh, gene therapy for kids with spinal muscular atrophy it was approved a couple of years ago. So we really gathered a lot of, of, of knowledge around this. Um, uh, we've also sadly gained knowledge of the acute liver injury through another gene therapy clinical trial for boys with an X-linked myotubular myopathy, where there were um, four deaths associated with um, uh, acute liver toxicity and subsequent liver failure. Now, this group of boys probably have a pre-existing um, underlying liver um, uh, conditions associated with their myopathy, um, but um, uh, knowledge of those deaths uh, and the uh, uh, two reported deaths in kids with SMA has put all of us on high alert uh, for this condition. The myocarditis um, is, is one that's a little bit more challenging for us to wrap our heads around because we monitor for myocarditis, we don't monitor for myocarditis really routinely, uh, but if someone has a troponin I level uh, uh, as part of their care, it can be elevated without um, any symptoms. And so um, we will be monitoring that. I'll talk about that in our monitoring plan. We will be monitoring for it, but we don't entirely know the extent of, of, of what um, we will see with myocarditis. Now, we do know within our community, um, there was a death associated with myocarditis or acute um, heart uh, decompensation. Uh, within a week of uh, an infusion as part of a clinical trial of a different gene therapy product. Uh, so again, we're on high alert. Um, we want families to understand the potential risk. So how do you as a family um, or we as providers plan for gene therapy? And a couple of things I wanna share. One, most hospitals are gonna look a little bit different. So there's not one unified gene therapy program for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Every hospital has its own processes and procedures. And so um, when you are talking online with your friends from across the country, you will likely hear slightly different variations of what their experience will be or is, um, and that's okay. It's important to know that there is uh, has been an amazing amount of planning and anticipation 
of the approval. Our hospital really for the last year has been working on it. Our hospital, like other hospitals, have already um, had the experience of implementing a gene therapy program because of our experience with spinal muscular atrophy and Zolzenzema. Um, and when I talk about planning, I'm talking about people from the laboratory, people from um, the pharmacy, our administrators um, are part of this. Um, and then our entire team of the neuromuscular team, so neurology, rehab medicine, our therapists, um, uh, our cardiologists, our pulmonologists, um, everyone is involved. We've pulled in our immunologists, we've pulled in our hepatologists who are liver doctors, uh, we've pulled in our, um, our hematologists because of the concern for this uh, um, entity called thrombotic mycoangiopathy, um, which is uh, an entity which um, uh, comes from an immune response. It causes uh, a change in platelets uh, and an impact on the kidneys. So our kidney doctors, our nephrologists are also involved. The other part about the planning, at least at the hospital level, is to assure that we can deliver this medication safely and sustainably. And that has to be our priority. So we have to have plans in place to uh, assure that every child receiving this is in the safest situation. And it has to be sustainable, meaning that not only does the first child have access to this, but the second, third, and years later, all children have access to this. And so the sustainability is, is really key as well. So our first steps um, uh, and the first steps uh, right now that you're probably taking uh, is looking at eligibility. Is your child four or five years of age? Um, our hope is that that eligibility will uh, expand uh, when the FDA receives additional information um, from Sarepta and from the clinical trial. But right now it's for four and five-year-olds. Uh, Dr. Butterfield mentioned um, the genetic um, uh, changes. So those who have lesions with an eight and nine will not be eligible. Uh, but all others will be. Um, people, uh, programs will be doing pre-treatment evaluations. So you will likely be sitting down with your providers and talking about the expectations, again, going over the risks and potential benefits uh, and really undertaking a, a, a consenting process. And, and really this idea of a, uh, of a memo of understanding, sort of what we expect from you and what you should absolutely expect from us. You'll be doing PT assessments similar to what you do in the clinic. Um, cardiology evaluations like the echo and EKG, if it's not been done in a X period of time prior to the infusion, and then laboratory assessment. So Dr. Butterfield mentioned AAV antibodies. Um, uh, in order to be eligible, you have to have uh, a low antibody titer uh, or you will not respond to this medication, so you will not be eligible. And we'll be doing safety labs. We want to make sure our baseline, your liver is healthy before we um, administer a drug that we know has potential for liver Know that behind the scenes, there's a lot of work being done. We're working on getting insurance approval so that your child can have access to this medication. Uh, and one thing I just wanna, something we learned from Zolgenzema, uh, our experience there was that oftentimes families would receive a letter ahead of time from their insurance company before we um, received anything saying that you've been approved for this treatment. And it's important to know that approval from an insurance company does not mean that they're actually going to pay for this treatment, or that they're going to pay a, um, you know, pay the hospital um, a, a reasonable amount for it. And so I just, I wanted to talk about that just so that you're aware um, that um, until your team tells you that you are moving forward and you've been approved and and starting to get scheduled, um, a letter from your insurance company sadly does not always mean uh, that you can move forward immediately. What can you do while you're waiting, right? So I think uh, as you know, there's a lot of work underway, and um, uh, but in the meantime, what can you do? One, make sure you get your regular medical care, right? It's important for your child to continue to receive all the medications, such as heart medications and corticosteroids, if they're on corticosteroids, um, if they're getting therapy services, if they are using a cough assist machine, uh, they should be getting that as well. Make sure they're up to date with all of their immunizations as well. So the four and five-year-old range is an interesting one because they will be due for sort of their five-year um, immunizations um, um, if they've not already received it. So um, in anticipation of that, you may want to talk with your primary care doctor. Make sure that they are getting their immunizations, even if it's a little early. You can usually do your 
five years, uh, a year earlier, because we don't want to give immunizations at the same time as we're giving gene therapy. We usually want to wait a month or so. We also, um, your child will be on steroids, uh, higher dose. And, and so we oftentimes then don't give immunizations for a couple of months thereafter. And so uh, making sure that your immunizations are up to date and, and talking with your care providers about whether or not you might want to do them uh, a little bit earlier. I've talked about steroids a lot. As part of a treatment plan, the package insert will read that uh, the child has to be on a steroid protocol to decrease this immune response. And it just depends on what steroid routine your child is on. If you're on daily, you'll get an additional one milligram per kilogram. If you're a weekend dosing family, you'll get daily prednisone um, for five days a week and then your high dose on your weekends. And it's okay if your child's not on baseline steroids. There's some four-year-olds, there are some five-year-olds that may not be on steroids at baseline and that is okay. You don't have to start them now in order to qualify. You will, however, be on higher dose steroids um, throughout that period. So one and a half milligrams per kilogram throughout the, um, uh, the infusion period. Um, typically the recommendation is you start a day before the infusion and you are on it for at least 60 days. So you take your regular steroids plus your additional steroids for at least 60 days. And then depending on the, your lab values, you'll be weaning thereafter. On the treatment day, um, you will only get the infusion uh, if you are well. So you wanna make sure your child is staying healthy has not had, uh, does not have an intercurrent illness, no fevers, runny nose, things like that, because we don't wanna have already a revved up immune system before we deliver this treatment. The actual day of the infusion may vary. Um, you know, Some people will do it in the clinic, others might choose to do it as a hospital stay, and in others, it might be in an infusion center. Um, and so you will learn through your care providers uh, where you will be receiving that infusion. As Dr. Butterfield said, it's kind of anticlimactic, it's over one or two hours, um, you'll be observed and then you'll be discharged home. Uh, in some situations, there may be some, some programs that want to keep you overnight. Uh, I did add a, a bullet on viral shedding, right? So you are getting this viral vector, you will shed it through your urine and stool. And so um, the recommendation is to um, uh, have the child and anybody helping the child uh, with toileting wash their hands um, 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 and for about a month afterwards so that you don't necessarily yourself mount an immune response to this viral vector. Or if you have another child, a younger or older son with Duchenne, or maybe a cousin um, with Duchenne uh, who might be interested in, in gene therapy, um, uh, you wanna make sure that they don't get exposed. And then monitoring post-infusion, again, it's gonna vary depending on the hospital, but the package insert says that we should be monitoring at least weekly. And we're looking at the liver labs. We're looking at the heart labs which is a troponin level and platelets. Um, we'll be doing clinic visits on a weekly basis. And it's important to know that those um, labs will help us dictate whether or not additional labs need to be drawn. Um, and so um, uh, there may be some in between those weekly visits. There may be some in between labs and, and visits as well. So, um, my final slide says anticipate the unexpected and, and, and it really probably should have said anticipate the expected because we have experience with gene therapy through the clinical trials or as with Shen and lots of experience over the last couple of years for children with spinal muscular atrophy. Um, expect that there may be a hospitalization uh, within that first week for dehydration. There could be for myocarditis or later on for elevated liver tests. Uh, my hope is it can be managed in the outpatient setting, but for some, it may require hospitalization. There's going to be a lot of clinic visits, um, and you may be meeting new providers like our hepatologists or our immunologists um, or our hematologists. Uh, and then expect that uh, you will be on prolonged and high dose steroids, um, uh, depending on the, the labs uh, that we're receiving uh, over the course of the, uh, you know, the monitoring period. So with that, I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to hand it back over to Dr. Butterfield, who can kind of wrap us up, and then um, we look forward to questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Apcon. Let me find my share here. The right one. I think it's this one. All right. You can see my screen. Looks good. All right. And, and hopefully you can hear me. I turned my mic up, so... I tend to be a low talker a little bit. Um, and, and I just, 
have one, this is just one slide to maybe talk about some questions and think about things um, as they relate to the future. So how do we think about this in, a, in really now a changed landscape for treatment in, in, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy? And I put this first one up all by itself because I think it's really important. Um, we have a little bit of a framework in our mind about medicines that that's more like a Tylenol than a transplant, but I think we need to think more like a transplant when we think about gene therapy. And in fact, I like to call it a gene transfer, almost like a gene transplant. Um, when we think about the delivery of the medicine and that sort of very uneventful one to two hour infusion, there's a lot of things happening both before and after that are really important parts of, of understanding the drug, its risks, its benefits, and its implementation. So, so I think as we sort of now tr just shift in our minds from, you know, a drug we take every day or something, you know, like a Tylenol, a really fancy Tylenol, to something like a transplant, I think that's that's an important part of it, the, the framework that we need to take as we, we um, get into these medicines. And, and, and from here on, so that's more of my statement, but um, and I just got some questions and some of these questions have popped up on the, on the chat, I think as well. Um, but we have a lot of questions still. So this approval is an accelerated approval in a rapidly changing field. And so there's still a lot of questions about how do, how do we balance risks and potential benefits? Uh, what are the long-term outcomes? Really the, the oldest boys who've been treated with this uh, drug is is just a couple of years. So so what are the long term? And then do we really are we ready to accept the risks of doing harm to get those benefits? And and how do we mitigate those harms? And there there was a question I saw in the in the chat about other type of immunosuppressive drugs. And there's a whole armamentarium of these type of drugs that have been developed in the autoimmunity world. And I think pulling immunologists into our teams is a really important part of thinking that through. So how do we mitigate these adverse events? So that's one whole set of questions that just isn't answered yet. Um, and there's a second part to mitigating serious events, which is better vector development. So, and this is already happening um, with some of the companies develop gene therapies is if we develop better vectors that have less side effects we, or lower doses, we, we mitigate side effects. So there's a lot of different potential avenues to think about both that potential benefit and that potential risk. But, but they're really in the large part open questions right now. And, we, and, and we're early enough in the game that we, we don't know all the answers. So this next set of questions is, is how do you consider which treatment to do based on the information we have now? And that can be a really hard question to answer. Um, I know a lot of people are frustrated with corticosteroids and the side effects and the long-term effect, you know, issues around corticosteroids. So, you know, should we change our recommendation on corticosteroid in patients who's received gene therapy? Should you just come off completely or do we stay on just like we might have if we didn't get gene therapy? Should we continue an FDA approved therapy, like an exon skipping therapy, is combined therapy a good idea? Or just continue on monotherapy and not try the gene therapy? We don't have a way to directly compare these therapies and their efficacy. So those can be a little bit of nuance around how to answer those questions. And then I did see, I think, one question in the chat, and I had this here already, but should we wait for something better? Um, there's multiple gene therapies in clinical trial now. Um, they all seem really promising, but we don't know um, how they'll turn out right now, right? And so maybe uh, a year from now, uh, we get a really better vector and it contains a whole DMD gene and we wanna take that therapy. And is that gonna be a potential or will the choices we make now limit our choices in the future? Certainly the choice to use an AAV mediated gene therapy right now can limit the potential for that choice down the road use it with the same vector because you're going to develop an immune response to that vector. There may be some ways to get around that using different type of immunosuppression regimens, but that's going to be an important question down the road. The other question is if there's a wearing off period of the drug, can we re-deliver it down the road? And, and there may be potential for that using some different immunosuppression as well. There's multiple different trials and I showed you some of them, but there's also other clinical trials that are not gene therapy in the sense of gene replacement, but gene therapy in the sense of genetic modulations like exon skipping that are 
with the current set of FDA approved drugs, quite inefficient, but can really improve on their efficiency with these next generation skippers. So there's gonna be a lot of questions about how do we do that, but we don't have a lot of data to go on and we have to make the decision now or in the near future. Um, I didn't put on the slide, but I think there was a question in the chat. Uh, do we expect a broader um, label in the future, in the near future, to include older children? And I'm, I think we're hopeful for that. And, and I think that will really depend a lot on the outcome of the Embark study. Um, and I just put this last comment in about cost, because I think we really need to come to terms about cost. And it, it may be difficult to get insurance coverage. I think Dr. Apcon mentioned that. Um, is, you know, what does it mean to get insurance coverage but not payment? And, and there's all these contracting and things that happen behind the scenes that, that can make it a little difficult. We've struggled with that with Zilgensma to some extent and, and hopefully find paths to get, get to treatment there, but it's not simple and requires a lot of work at multiple levels within the hospital, not just the medical side, but also the administrative and business side of the hospital. I just put the, the, the gene therapies that are approved by the FDA that I know about. So Zogensma for SMA, which was approved in 2019 is, is $2 million drug. And we had three therapies approved or two therapies approved last year that in the sort of $3 million range, the cost for Elevid is, is estimated at three point, or the least price anyway, is 3.2 million. These are very high cost drugs. And, and we really need to think about sustainability of therapies like this, especially if we're gonna get to a time where we're doing combination therapies, which I expect we will at some point, we'll have different targets for different therapies, just the way we do with, with cancers. Um, and, and we need to think about as a community, how we can move forward at these high cost drugs. And that's not just a question for the DMD community, but for all the rare disease community, right? So if we have a therapy for hemophilia and adrenal lobe dystrophy and SMA and Duchenne, which are already approved, but now add 10 more things that are approved that really starts having an impact uh, on the whole medical community. So they're, they're important questions. Um, and I think we need to sort of build a framework for them. So I'll, I'll just leave that as sort of the questions I, I threw out there and we're happy to take additional questions and, and peek back at the chat again. So I'll, I'll just switch my slide off here. All right, thank you, Dr. Hapcon and Dr. Butterfield. That was really helpful. As you might imagine, there's a million questions out here that that some of some of those questions we just don't have answers to. But one of the biggest biggest issues of confusion, I think, is around this eight and nine exclusion. So does that mean if you have a duplication in eight and nine, or you have a point mutation between eight and nine, are you are you excluded from this, or what is this eight and nine? Is it limited to a deletion? That is a really good question. Um, the, the label does not provide anything beyond that, that slide that I put up. Um, I think we're going to have to think about that in the context of the mechanism. Um, and, the, and the idea there is if you're missing it, those regions of exon 8 and 9, like from a deletion, you may make a response to that part of the gene because it's in the transgene. If you have a duplication, that may, may or may not be true. Um, and I think we just have to answer that question probably individually. Um, no, most many of the genetics questions will be um, will be need to be discussed with the healthcare uh, with the team about that. But it is confusing, as you might imagine, when you have a duplication or a point mutation, or your your son's mutation is is nine ten, for instance, or seven eight. About how does how does that going to work? So I think those will be those those discussions as individually with the healthcare providers, and yeah, then answer maybe then that sort of overlapping like seven, eight, nine, eleven, or what, I think those will be excluded if they're a deletion. Okay, so Thank any you. deletion around those two, that's what I thought as well. Um, but the dupe, so if we get also just other genetic questions, people are asking about if you have a duplication of exon two, for example, or if you're an in-frame, um, but clinically diagnosed as Duchenne, are, would those individuals likely be candidates for this therapy? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't see a good exclusion. Okay, good, good. All right, and then a, a little bit. Yeah, so first of all, Sue, if you could explain this innate and adaptive response, what's the difference between an innate response and an adaptive response? 
Yeah, the innate response is just something that we have uh, in, in general terms, just it's just a part of our uh, immune response, our, our immune system that doesn't require time. So over time, your body adapts to um, a, a foreign body, a, a virus of some sort. And so you create different types of cells. Um, and so that's why we probably see uh, as it's adapting to the viral vector, as an example, um, we're creating an immune response that's later. And so the liver toxicity or liver injury is, um, is an example of that. So, I mean, I, it, for me, I rely heavily on my immunologist because it's a complicated sort of system. I think, you know, looking through the chat and I think some people are super smart here and asking some great questions and, and, um, uh, someone had asked about some of the different um, medications used in the immune response. And I think that 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 person is spot on in terms of thinking about how we can prevent some of the, these responses, the adaptive response. Um, and I, I, I think that probably moving forward, we will see the initiation of some of these other medications, whether it's with this particular gene therapy or with some of the others um, that, that come down the pike. But I, I do think that there are, you know, from our... Um, uh, you know, from like our rheumatology colleagues, as an example, they deal with the immune response all the time. I mean, I think we're going to see the use of some of these other medications. Um, yeah, I, I think as we've had protocol discussion, discussions, generally we hear of people thinking about sirolimus and other drugs to 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 use a, a, in their protocol, but in this protocol, that is that is not um, included. So a little bit about just the mechanics of this. What if you live in, I'll give you an example, I live in Middletown, Ohio, and, and I come to Colorado, and I, I know you have to be in your cohort of patients you treat, so I've already gone out, outside the line. But let's say I bring my son to you um, to be treated, and then can I return to Middletown, Ohio, and have a local doc take care of these tests and notify you, or how will that work from a distance um, to the site? I'm happy to just share my, you know, sort of my thoughts. And again, this goes back, Pat, to that every every program, every neuromuscular team may have a, a little bit of a different answer. Um, so, because of the risks associated with this treatment, um, I feel strongly uh, that um, we should be providing care to the kids who are in our community, or in my case, in our region. We take care of kids in a seven-state region, um, and. Um, it's going to be important that 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 weekly follow up um, uh, is done uh, by someone who can manage the results. So, for example, if a child um, who lives in, in my case, maybe um, up in uh, Wyoming or um, or Montana, who's you know six or eight hours away from a tertiary care children's hospital, who can manage this, that's probably not in my mind going to be the safest situation. And so we will be asking families to stay local for a period of time so that we're able to closely monitor them and address any issues that come up. Um, and so again, every program is gonna be a little different, but I feel strongly that, that a child who's receiving this treatment needs to have very close follow-up in a community who can manage their um, adverse events if they were to have any. Uh, again, the myocarditis, the liver um, uh, injury are, are two good examples. And then um, the long-term follow-up that FDA is requiring and not just follow-up for the first 60 or 70 days, but what happens after that and how long, how long and how much follow-up would be included and would, again, we want to come to the, the site where, where this child received gene therapy? So for, for me, I mean, it's important to state that this is not a cure. Um, this is a treatment and we hope a really good treatment, but it, the, the child will still have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I, I say that because it means that they're gonna to continue to require long-term care within a comprehensive uh, muscle clinic um, where they can continue to receive care by a cardiologist and a pulmonologist um, and therapists and their neuromuscular providers. And so while the intensity uh, weekly visits will be you know, um, the first few months, um, the expectation for me will be my patients will continue um, to come to our clinic every six months um, uh, at the very least, and then more often if, if there are issues that need to be addressed. And I would probably just add to that because I, I think we feel the same way, uh, is that we'll be doing uh, these type of motor function assessments similar to what was done on the trials. And that'll extend probably not every six months, but six months to a year where we'll do those more formal motor function assessments. Because we are really interested in these longer term outcomes and we 
we're not going to see them from clinical trials. So actually capturing that data as a, as a more scientific interest, I think, is really important at, at our site as well. And that so can't be done at just any place. And isn't the FDA requirement five years following and then 15 years of, of safety? I, I think that the interest is there, but there's no model for it. <laughs> So it's, I think every and every different center is kind of creating that that on their own, but we're we're definitely interested in in those type of long term outcomes. Thank you. And and there's questions about uh, first off label use. Can someone come to this country and access the therapy? And if someone comes to this country and is and fits the original criteria at least that exist right now, four to five, how long do they have to stay in this country? Um, could first of all, can they receive it? Be uh, coming from another country? Are they eligible? And then would they have to stay? That's a good question. Um, that we've struggled with with SMA at our center. I know there's been patients come and receive Zolgensma for SMA here that are coming from outside the United States. I think that depends on a family's ability to cover costs and to stay locally in a time frame that we can do those proper evaluations, especially in the first few months. I don't know that that's available to most patients and it creates some complexity in our systems um, due to cost that um, we probably won't, at least in our center, be seeing international patients at least right away until we kind of figure out the rhythm of how these things will work in our patients from our communities in the region. Thank you. And Sue, in your, in your um, system, you will or will not accept um, international patients that come in? You will not be accepting international patients at this point. Okay. And again, back to this limitation of the, the four fives. Um, I'm oh, sorry, the five sixes um, or fives. This age is really confusing me lately. So what if your child is five years and nine months today, comes to your clinic and you start the process and you don't have an answer about insurance coverage or payment until this child turns six? Um, first of all, that would feel like the diagnosis all over again. So how, how do you see that? And how will we at least protect those children who are on the verge of aging out? You know, I, I can just, I mean, that's for us, that's, you know, something that's on our mind. And as we've looked at the list of kids who might be eligible or families who might be eligible, we're looking at birth dates to make sure that no one's going to age out. At the same time, uh, maybe I, it's magical thinking, um, but I'd like to think that when, when the, the age, if we start the process before age five, um, and while the approval might come after, you know, when the child turns six, that they will still be eligible to receive. From a safety standpoint, it's not, I have no concerns about losing a six-year-old um, or a seven-year-old. Um, uh, so it really, and I think for me, at least, it will come up, uh, come to the insurance company. Uh, and again, I'd like to think that if we start the process uh, at the appropriate time, it won't be an issue. I can't promise yeah. that. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, uh, that's the worry is the, at the end, at the, uh, the payer end, that there will be a, a, a decision made based on the age of the child. So um, we're, we're very hopeful that at the initiation of the start form or whatever form it is that you initiate the process, um, that, that we will get that child included. Um, also the payers, you know, we talked about approved and payment. Can you speak a little bit more about the payer that says you're approved for this therapy and then you, the, the, the institution has to make sure that the payment is received or how does that work? You know, I can just uh, talk very, you know, Dr. Broderfield <laughs> mentioned, it's a complex situation. Um, and because you were working, you know, with the hospital um, uh, and insurance companies, and there's a lot of back and forth. So the approval for me, at least from an insurance company means that, you know, that they, you know, it's part of their policy, right? So that they include gene therapy in their policy and the child meets the age recommendation and the genetic change recommendation. And so they will approve it. But the reality is there needs to be a contract between the hospital and the, um, uh, and the insurer uh, to make sure that the cost is covered. Um, and so that's just the piece. The approval is definitely separate from the, you know, they usually have a contract that they put in place um, uh, that, that uh, is between the, the hospital system and the, uh, and the insurance company saying that they will, you know, not only have they approved it, but they will pay X amount of money um, uh, to deliver this medication. 
And right. Russ, do you see a difference in your world uh, on people who are in private insurance versus people who are on some of the Medicaid uh, or Medicaid insurance? No, I'll, I'll tell you, I've been in a couple of states now and um, private insurance and public insurance has paid for gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. So our kids uh, on our Colorado Medicaid, uh, Montana Medicaid, Wyoming Medicaid, um, we have been very fortunate and gotten approval and um, been able to move forward with that. And we, we've had the same experience with, with Medicaid and private insurances. And, and that the contracting part is important. And that, that, that's been a barrier to some families, uh, at least to the timing. And SMA, that timing can be really a lot of time pressure. But that contract happens for every individual patient. Um, and, and as you sort of think about from a hospital perspective, you're spending $3 million on a therapy. Um, they're going to negotiate a cost and a price directly with the insurance company um, based on what the farm, what the hospital pharmacy is paying to get that drug purchased. And, and there's all different ways that hospitals have thought about how to do that or how to extend that over some long period of time or to try to wait to base it on efficacy outcomes or other things. But all those things kind of happen outside of our control sometimes as well. Um, and so we, we often are waiting on that contract. Right. So, so one of the questions is really around the fact that there might have been someone who believed the drug company covers the cost. And no, the costs are not covered by the drug company. It's really about the insurance that you have. Um, and we talked a little bit about international patients. And I know, Sue, you don't accept international patients. But in the event that there is, an, uh, is a site that will it accept international patients, they would have to have some sort of financial coverage of that, either personally or through their government or however that works, right? Yeah. Okay. We are, I know we're coming to the hour and I don't know if you all have a few more minutes to spend. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the viral shedding. There is, a, you know, under the circumstances of a child receiving a gene transfer um, and they're on increased steroids and there is the viral shedding that we're washing our hands based on urine and stool exposure to the virus. A couple of questions. One is, can you send them to school? Two is if you have two or more boys with Duchenne, do you separate them? Um, if one fits into the current uh, uh, into the current uh, approval process in the four to fives, um, do you have to separate them and for how long? I don't think either of us want to answer that question because it's we don't have good data. I, we, we are collecting some of these data in studies now. Um, I think the concept is that if you're shedding, you could become exposed to the virus and then generate an immune response, right? So called so-called zero conversion that could potentially make you ineligible to receive the therapy down the road. Um, I think the best barrier to that is good hygiene. I, I think by far the most important thing. And I've heard, especially early on in the trials of families that might separate you know, brothers for months, um, even in living in different homes. And I think that's probably overkill. Um, but where's the right middle ground? I don't know. For for a child who's old enough to manage their own hygiene and things, I think over a period of one to two months, um, that risk really disappears after that first couple of months. But, it, but particularly in those first few weeks, um, it, it can be reasonable to separate them if that's simple, or even just have them in different parts of the home, or, you know, whatever program that people, I think, talk about with, with your providers to come up with a more concrete program. But I think the hygiene is, is the most important part of it. The school part, I think, is also important. I, and, and one thing maybe to emphasize, I don't think there's a risk to anyone else from this drug. Say, if someone, a parent or a teacher or another student at school is exposed to this drug, you know, would it cause the same type of adverse events we're talking about? And I don't think there's really a significant risk for that. It's really the risk of seroconversion that we're worried about. Um, I would probably keep a child out of school for a period of weeks more just based on the height of steroid, the risk for exposure to viruses to the child than I would for the um, the potential zero conversion things. And also just the frequent visits. And a lot of times at our center, we have patients coming from multiple states and very long distances as well. So we're often out of school at that point anyway. Thank you. Uh, one maybe last question because I know we're over time. And this really has to do with the advisory committee meeting 
Uh, the advisory committee meeting, um, as all of us um, and many of us probably online watched that advisory committee meeting, when we when we heard that some of the advisory committee um, said no um, in terms of, you know, in terms of that decision uh, that was an eight to six. Can you shed a little light on why some would say no? Because the expectations of gene therapy and replacing uh, getting a microdystrophin or any dystrophin for that matter into the cell are so um, fundamental to parents and families who, who feel that that will reasonably likely make a difference. Why would anyone vote no in your view? Maybe you want, I have some things, but you could talk to you. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I'll go to Russ. Okay. Um, I could tell you um, that there's this conflict in our minds that is driven by the science and the humanity of it all. And we, as a, as a group of scientists, want these drugs to be available and to work and to be safe. And I think as a, a real human being, we want them for all those same reasons. But the scientists want to be extra careful on some of those those issues. And, and at the end of the day, we don't come home to a boy with muscular dystrophy. Um, so that's a different space. And I think the FDA lives in a different space than I do as a provider, because I do see these boys and I know them over decades sometimes and want to provide that therapy. But um, the FDA doesn't live in that space either. They live in this very clean space where the everything is black and white, but but it's not, right? And so I think they struggle with the tension there, just like we struggle with the tension there. And some people land on that part where they'd want more data and want to see that drug works better. Um, so I think that those are fair. Um, in my case, I've seen the worst thing that can happen. And I've seen a boy who died after getting gene therapy. And that was devastating. That was devastating for his family. That was devastating for us as a team. And that I never want to see that ever again, right? I, so to me, I have a, a high threshold for, for safety and for efficacy and being rigorous about these kind of studies. So, so that's sort of, sort of my two cents there. Like, but I think we all want the same thing. I think we want to treat these boys. I think we just want to do it right. Sue, you want to follow up? No, I mean, I appreciate your comments, Russ, and I think that the, it is this tension between the risk and benefit, and when you're using a, a surrogate endpoint, um, for me, in this case, dystrophin um, uh, production, um, uh, for me, uh, at least, um, uh, uh, when I'm balancing the risk and the benefit, um, um, uh, I, I'm still waiting for that uh, the benefit being function or the reposition that ultimately for me uh, is the right case is the right is the right endpoint. I think at the FDA level, um, they are scientists uh, and they are, as you said, Russ, black and white, um, and they they want definitive answers. And when there's sometimes this grayness, it's a little hard. Um, and so I am actually grateful to the FDA um, for granting approval uh, in this way. Um, uh, what I'd like to see it expanded. Um, uh, in uh, what I do, I want uh, and expect um, us to be gathering ongoing data uh, so that we can really um, make sure that long term uh, we understand the safety uh, and again the functional benefits, which is what we're hoping to see. Um, so I um, again I, I appreciate that we have this opportunity to talk about this, that we can talk about the approval, we can talk about the treatment planning and the. You know, there's even the, the side effects, um, which we don't want to talk about, but they're there. Um, and without that FDA approval, we always had it. So um, I don't know if those are my two kind of thoughts. Thank you, Sue. I, I think that's the tension, right? When um, I think the community always asks, how much data do you need? And we want these young, these people to, uh, that access this therapy to be safe. And at the same time, we know that time is muscle, as we're all saying, right? And time marches on. And trying to intervene with a therapy that can slow this progression is, is something we all desire. So I can't thank you enough for participating today. I'm gonna to turn this back over to Eric to close out, but I'm sure this is not the end of the world in terms of our discussions and I'm sure they'll continue. Thanks, Pat. And, and thanks Russ and Sue for a really great webinar. Um, for the families, I, I did wanna just share a couple of points because there was obviously a lot of question around insurance, around the, the uh, genetic variants. Um, 
did want to share, we are working closely with our community partners and the payers, so the in insurance companies themselves on how we can improve access and, and coverage to gene therapy. Um, as you are looking for those resources and trying to navigate it, we do have um, an access and reimbursement um, pages on the website. You can find them under the advocacy dropdown. Uh, that'll take you to a lot of those. We're going to continue to build out um, some educational materials on gene therapy, so you'll be able to find those on the website as well. Um, if you have specific questions about you or your child and their genetic variant and whether or not you, know, you have access for this therapy or, or other clinical trials um, that you may be eligible for, we strongly suggest you sign up for um, PPMD for you. Um, those are one-on-one -on -one sessions you can have with our genetic counselors who are all excellent. Um, if you go onto the website, there's a little floating kind of text bubble down in the, the right-hand screen. Um, I think Alexis also put it in the chat window. Um, so you know, please use that resource if you have any of those questions. If you are trying to dig a little bit deeper into some of the, you know, um, immune system kind of questions, as Russ mentioned, we did co-host a webinar with uh, the NIH specifically on transgene response. And if you search NIH in our kind of search bar, the first one that comes up will be that NIH webinar. Um, if you attended the conference, Dr. Barry Byrne gave a really um, in-depth um, kind of overview about innate and um, adaptive immune response. You can search if you attended the, uh, the, the conference, it's available now on the app. If not, we will have this up on the website in the next few weeks. Um, and then finally, you know, this webinar is recorded. So if you, you know, there's a lot of material here. If you need to view it again, we should have it up within the next week. If you have family or friends who this would be helpful for, uh, please direct them to that. Uh, but we want to thank everyone for really great, great questions today. And again, uh, Dr. Butterfield and Dr. Apcon for joining us to, to walk us through what is a complex topic and something we need to continue to, you know, talk about. But we really appreciate your time. Both.